<coughs> Woo. All right, well, we are live. Let's go ahead and share the desktop. Do -do -do -do. Looks like the desktop shared. Come in here. We will actually briefly, let's briefly look at our schedule. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you, for showing up. <laughs> Hopefully, the rest of you will be watching this either live currently. Uh, we'll see if you show up on the video or you'll watch it later because you need to know what's going on. Here's what's going on. So sixth week, uh, first of all, I apologize for, for not getting homework graded. That is not normally my deal. I have a lot of stuff going on. I'm, I don't have my kids this week, so I'll spend the next few days getting caught up um, so you'll know where you stand. What we're going to do today is I'm going to lecture on Chapter 6, and then Wednesday uh, we will – I will assign teams for your projects, okay? So my goal is by Wednesday to have all the grading done so I can see where people are and team you up appropriately, okay? Um, the biggest thing I want to make sure is that I don't end up with a, you know, what do they call it when you stack a team that you know is going to win? They're like the dream team, right? You know what I'm talking about? So I want to make sure that that, that, that doesn't happen. Part, part of the project is not just figuring out the software for personal trainer and presenting it, but also more importantly, dealing in teams, you know, and dealing with folks that, that may or may not be um, totally engaged. So, so we'll do the lecture Wednesday. We'll pick teams. We'll talk about the project. And then starting with week seven, first of all, in week seven, although you're required to know the material, there's no homework in week seven. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I want you guys to get a jump start on the project. Here's how the rest of the weeks tend to go uh, up until week 10. Um, Mondays, we will meet. I will lecture. And Wednesdays, you will meet with your team. Okay? You can meet with your team in the room. You can meet with your team at the library. You can choose to meet with your team at another time. If you all decide 7.45, I'm done with it. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, keep in mind you have a bunch of technology. Now, week nine will be unique in that week nine uh, we have a holiday. Stupid holidays. I would be here, but I'm sure you all wouldn't want to show up. So consequently, I will lecture on chapter nine. So that's, that's where we're at today. I'm going to bust into chapter six. Again, we'll pick teams or I will assign teams on Wednesday. We'll talk in detail about the project. And then what I do for the rest of the class is turn you all loose to start working on schedules, when you're going to meet, you know, et cetera, okay? We'll talk about sort of the rules of the project, no information. I won't share information of it individually with teams. So any questions that need to be asked need to be asked on Mondays, okay? Um, if you want, you can send an email, and I just start a little list of questions. I think this term, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Google document, like a Google spreadsheet. And we can just keep track of questions that teams may have, okay, and then answer them in class. Does that sound okay? I hope so, because that's how it works. Is, is the majority of the work in class, or is there going to be some that we need to be So, so here's, here's normally how it works. Um, as a team, you will decide who's going to take care of what part, okay? So sometimes... You find out, well, I'm a really good researcher, but I hate to, you know, I hate to do presentations. You know, I hate to create them. One of the requirements, however, is every person in your group has to stand in front of this class and give part of the presentation, okay? Um, that's, that's one of the outcomes outside of sort of what's going on. Does that make sense? So it's really up to your team. I've had teams that have been highly efficient that say, you know what, we're, we're going to use the class time wisely. We're going to just keep to the class time. We're going to come in. We're going to work on the project, and we're going to be able to get it done. You know, um, I mean, basically, what is that? Uh, the 10th week, on Wednesday of the 10th week, we have a small enough class that we'll be able to successfully do all the presentations on that day. So that will be presentation day. A lecture on Chapter 10. And then Wednesday is presentation day. So that week, you're not going to have any time. So you're going to need to schedule time with your team. Cool? Any other questions? I think we'll cover it all on Wednesday. All right? Question? Okay, just checking. You look kind of inquisitive. Maybe you're awake and ready for a lecture.
You're ready. That's what I like to hear. I got one person ready. That's awesome. Well, Cody's got his energy drink, so he's ready too. All right. If uh, the door becomes a distraction, let me know. It seems a little warm in this room. So um, so if it is, uh, we'll go. So we're going to skip the objectives. Let me go back here. So what are we talking about? <coughs> we're talking about object modeling. So this is where we start getting into more of the programmatic aspect, okay? Um, as you all probably know, how many people have taken the 122 class? So we have a general understanding of what object-oriented programming is, right? So why do we program things into objects? What's, what's the idea behind creating an object? Reusable, right? Code reuse. Modular, yep. So we can instantiate that object as many times as we need to, right? Okay. So that way we don't have to, you know, continue to program the same thing. <coughs> I apologize for the coughing. My uh, allergies are not conducive to working in the yard, but the yard work still needs to get done. It's weird. It's totally weird, right? So, you know, I made the mistake of turning on the water and fertilizing the lawn, which also seemed to fertilize the weeds. Go figure. All right, so we'll talk about object-oriented analysis. So here's this idea that we're still looking at that logical infrastructure of our software that we're going to develop, but it really starts getting down into the objects and how we might program the application, okay? So, you know, which is another way to view or model system requirements, object-oriented methods to document, analyze, and model the information system because if we're using the same methodology to model it as we would to program it, it would make theoretical sense that the two should be able to link together. Agreed? All right. Agreed? Wow. Whew. Good thing Eric Thomas isn't here. We are going to watch an Eric Thomas inspirational video after this. That's all there is. Get you guys inspired for your week. So. So object-oriented analysis, the object, we'll talk about that. Um, popular approach that sees a system from the viewpoint of the objects themselves as they function and interact. So as we think about it, when we did the Wednesday practice in the design, right, of, I'm trying to think what, oh, of our hotel reservation system, right? How cool was that? When we did that, we started to see some objects form. Okay, we worked with projects, but we had some objects as well. Our external entities could have essentially been objects, right? So we had these these things called, for some reason, you all decided we needed customers. I, I don't know why, but we needed customers who would book rooms, right? So we can start looking at that and bringing it together by saying we could have a customer object that has all of the attributes right, of what a customer is, okay, and all the methods, all the things a customer would do, right? So one of our methods would be book room. Would we agree? And then some ingenious person said, before I can book the room, I got to be able to do a search on what I'm looking for, right? What Do, do you remember what we called that? Because I think that was your idea. Was it? Okay, I'll wait five. I'll wait five minutes, and 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 you'll be engaged. Did you have coffee this morning? A little bit. Okay, we'll wait for it to kick in. All right. So I'll answer the question. So the the answer is we had an object called you know search. I think it was seek room or search room or something like that. You know or find. Oh no, find find room. So find reservation or whatever. So anyway, so we start modeling the system. So here's an example. First of all, like with anything, there's a standard language that we can use. When we standardize these tools, um, what it means is that we can take this language, apply it to other projects, and the people that are involved in the project, if we're all speaking the same language, are we going to be able to communicate better? Yeah? Cool. Wow, you all are resounding at 745 in the morning on Mondays. <laughs> Woo! All right. Maybe we should cancel class till 8. I'm, I'm just not sure. 
Hmm? So argue. You wouldn't argue. All right, so in an object, we have these, these five main parts. So what are attributes? So it says the car object has characteristics called attributes, such as make, model, and color. Okay, so what are those? What do they do for the object, in this case, the object car? They describe it, right? So if we were going to put this into, I know, I hate to do this all to you. If we were to put this in a lit comp class or a writing class, an attribute would be a what? Adjective. adjective, right? It would be an adjective. And then we have methods. So methods operate wipers, apply breaks. What are those? Processes. They're processes, yeah. They're functions, yeah, we could think of them as both, of the object, right? So what's the lit, what's the English equivalent? A verb. It's the action, right? So methods are verbs. And what's a message? Well, it says the driver object sends messages to the car object, such as clean the windshield or slow down. Now, I don't happen to like this this example okay i would say the message would be the method is operate wipers how do i tell the car i want to operate the wipers i have flipped the wiper thing right so somehow when i flip that a message has to get to the wiper motor to turn on to do its thing does that make sense can the car object give us back messages? You know, today in modern cars, right, if you get too close to the car in front of you, it goes, D -d 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 -d, right? Like, hey, you're following too close, you idiot. I mean, are we really dumbing down driving so much? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> yeah, rear view cameras, you know. If you put anything inside these lines, you might hit it, you know. Yeah, you know, as my son's learning to drive right now, <laughs> yes, I'll take all the sympathy you want to give me. My son is learning to drive. Um, I'm making sure he doesn't focus because I, when I first got the rearview camera, I started focusing so much on it that I wasn't doing what I used to do, checking my blind spots, checking my mirrors. So if you're watching this, Dawson, I'm checking my blind spots and my mirrors, okay? All right, so we have messages. What's a class? A group of objects that are what? Uh, they're similar, they share attributes. Similar, right, they share attributes. And then finally, what's an instance? Be careful. It's not the whole process. It is an instance of the object. Okay, so let me give you an example. An instance of an object called car might be Ferrari, right? Could another instance of the object be Volkswagen? It could be. Now, what we're going to see is that we want to generalize an object and then we'll create child objects that further define specific characteristics, right? So in layman's terms, we can have this object called human being, right? Now, do we all know some human beings that fall into a pleasurable object and a not so pleasurable object? Do we all know those people? Yeah, right? So here's the idea, <laughs> a parent object. So characteristics that describe the parent. So every parent object is gonna have a name, age, gender, hair color, Methods might be read bedtime story, drive and carpool. Okay. Instance of the parent object. So here's three instances. We have a Mary Smith, uh, Hamad Ali, and Anthony Green. Okay. So if you notice, these are all instances of the object. I've called the object three times to create these instances. <coughs> okay. So then we get down to a child object. And in this case, the child object has the same attributes as the parent object, okay, with some additional attributes, 
and maybe similar or different methods. So in this case, we have this child object, number of siblings, methods, pick up toys, I wish, eat dinner, I wish, play, that one they do well, cooperate, thank you, <laughs> and get ready for bed, I wish. All right, <laughs> y'all are getting the idea. Uh-oh. Another object, dog. So we have this dog object, name, breed, age. Now, as we know, when, when we start looking at this object child or the parent object, okay, the parent object, the child object, the dog object, what would you suggest we do with this name as it pertains to attributes? What would we do? Normalize it. Okay, how would I normalize the name? Uh, close. Yeah. Add a prefix. Okay, so so what you're saying is, I, I think what you're saying is I really need two attributes. A first name attribute and a last name attribute, right? Does that normalize it? Yeah, it normalizes it. So we would bring this object, you know, today object-oriented programming extends to the database, okay? Because where are we going to store all these objects? And instances of an object, you bet, in a database. <laughs> all right, so here we go. We have this thing called student object, this thing called instructor object. Um, gee, we have a student number, an instructor number. Name, address, telephone number, you know, instructor fitness classes taught. You know, different things that each one can do. But could we create a parent object and then have two child objects with the different attributes? Do you see some commonality here? Do you? Yes? Okay. So consequently, maybe as we program this, we have some object above student, above instructor that would be common. It really depends. From a security standpoint, we may want to have these separate objects and keep the information in separate tables in the database. Right? So it depends, really, if we're ever going to combine or search for students and instructors that meet a criteria. <coughs> so attributes, if objects are similar to nouns, attributes are similar to adjectives. We talked about that. Some objects might have a few attributes, others might have dozens, and then there's the state of an object. So I would ask you guys to do some work. Tell me what the state of an object is. You can Google it. Maybe you read the chapter. Tell me what the state of an object is. Feel like I need to cut the silence on the video. It's like do 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 everybody help me with the bum bum when we get there. Dun 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 That's the best. oh my gosh people Boom, boom. Thank you very much for your support. My goodness. The attributes of an object at a given time, or perhaps the methods at, of an object. Okay? So the state of the object, if we instantiate it, right, then we brought it sort of to life. But can we have an object that is just sitting there waiting to be instantiated? Yeah. Right? Does it mean that at every time, every method must be going on for an object? No. Okay. So methods, of course, we've talked about. I think this is, you know, pretty, pretty understandable. So we have a method called more fries. Don't ask me why. 
okay? But every time I get to this slide in every single class, mostly in, in, in the winter class, I go to that video, ding, fries are done, ding, fries are done, ding, fries are done. I know you all have seen it, right? Okay, good. Yeah, so, so we have this method called more fries. Here's the steps. Here's what we need to program. We need to somehow programmatically heat the oil, fill the fry basket, lower basket into hot oil, check for readiness. When ready, raise the basket, let drain, pour fries into, and add salt. And if you're McDonald's, add more salt because that's what makes a McDonald's fry a fry, in my humble opinion. <laughs> so we've talked about those before. So here's this idea. We have this method, so overview of object-oriented analysis. So messages, the things we send, okay? <laughs> Let's talk about the three types of messages, okay? We're going to actually start with the, with the lowest one, which is encapsulation. So, you know, here's this message, good night, and if you notice, <clears throat> If we send the goodnight message to the parent from whatever object we're sending it to, it causes the parent object to read a bedtime story. Okay? So the message is, you know, read bedtime story, yay! Right? If we send it to the dog, the dog doesn't read the bedtime story, the dog finds a place to go to sleep, we hope. <laughs> we send it to the child object, causes the child object to get ready for bed. In which we say, I wish, <laughs> right? So what's encapsulation? Okay, in front of you is this crazy thing called the, a computer. And that computer connects to a really cool thing called the internet. It was designed by, by Mr. Al Gore. So let's see what Al Gore might have put on the internet for us as it pertains to encapsulation. Encapsulation. Packing of data and functions into a single component. So what we're saying here is we have this message. The message is in order for the message to process, we need to give it some data. Okay. And then we need to programmically tell it what to do with that data. Okay. And depending on which object we send that message to, it could do different things. What do you mean, like a letter? Yep. So, yeah, encapsulate data inside a letter and send it. Yep. And if we send the same letter to different people, we're going to get a... could potentially get a different response, right? <laughs> or a different action. So... How cool would it be, instead of having to program, we're going to jump up to the top one, instead of having to program in our program three or four or five, in this case three, different actions that result from this message called goodnight, what if we could actually design a program that was smart enough to know to do whatever it needed to do based on the message we sent to each object. That is polymorphism. Okay? And that is a very, very high level program. So somebody look up, please, the definition of polymorphism. It's uh, the provision of a single interface of two entities of different types. Woo! Whoa, can you give that to us again a little slower? It's, it's morning time, and we're going to have to decipher what that means in real English. Okay. Uh, polymorphism is the provision of a single interface to entities of different types. So provision of a single interface to two entities of different types. It could be multiple entities. Does somebody else have a different definition? Message or concept that emotes and gives different meanings to different objects. I like that one a little bit better. We are saying the same thing. We're just saying it a little bit more understandable at 8, 10 in the morning. Okay? So give that to us again. The concept that a message has different meanings to different objects. The concept that a message has different meanings to different objects. Hmm. And that somehow some genius programmed it to know that. Okay? 
So what's a black box? We've already talked about a black box. Something that we can't see the details of. We just know we need something that's going to take this data, do something with it, and return something else, right? That's what a black box is. So messages, major advantage of object-oriented uh, designs is that systems analysts can save time and avoid errors by using modular objects, and programmers can then translate those into the design, into the actual working code, and <coughs> we get reusability. I mean, really, with how much code has been designed today, how much code do you really have to write yourself? Possibly none. If I need a, Cody, if I need a calculator object for uh, Visual Studio.net, you think I could find one or maybe a thousand of those on the web? Yeah. Grab the code. Now, what I do need to do is be proficient enough coder to know that that object is going to do what I want, right? And that it's been quality tested. <laughs> or just be able to alter it. You bet. You know, so we have this instructor entity or object. We're going to send the message, enter grade, and the grade's going to go in the student record. So from a polymorphic side, the instructor just enters the grade. And from there, maybe somebody's programmed this polymorphically to say, you know, if the student got an A, if we receive an A, do this. If we receive a B, do this. If we receive a C, do this. If D, do this. E. Oh, there is no E, huh? We skip E. We go right to F. Someday, i got a funny feeling there'll be an E. We'll call it a below, below average, but you're not yet failing. I don't know. I found out in high schools now, a D minus is still passing a class. Yeah. Yeah, they don't do that here in this place called college. You know, it's more like the real world. But a D minus is passing a class. <coughs> it's not going to set you up for life, but it's passing a class. All right, so class is an object belongs to a group or category called a class. Okay, all objects within the class share common attributes and methods. Then we have these subclasses or superclasses. So remember a couple slides back. I know we haven't been there for a few minutes. But we had this instructor object and this student object, and they both shared additional attributes, right? So that was a class. Would we create a subclass or a superclass of that class with all the common objects? So it's going about. Huh? <clears throat> nope, it would be a superclass. Okay, so superclass might be, you know, I don't know what we call it, human. So here's a great example of classes. So we have this class called vehicle. Well, a vehicle can be many things, right? My little scooter could be a vehicle. Let's see. Could it? Does it have a make? A model? A year? A weight? A color? Can I start it? Stop it? Park it? Yeah, I can. I can't subclasses of this thing called vehicle. So we have this vehicle class, and then we create some subclasses with specific attributes or methods that apply to that class. <coughs> so let me give you an example of this. So if you notice with attribute, did we have in attributes of class vehicle number of wheels? Is that something that might vary? We might take that attribute over to car, minivan, truck, school bus. I hate this. Let's add motorcycle. Is a motorcycle a vehicle? Yes. So what kind of things might be different from car, minivan, truck, school bus? One might be number of wheels. What's another thing that might be different in a subclass? Engine. Huh? Engine. Engine? Yep. Uh, passenger capacity. Ah, passenger capacity. Yeah. Although I did see a picture a while back of four people riding on a moped in India. A lot of crazy things in Southeast Asia. Yeah. 
<laughs> different methods? Do we see different methods? Well, truck load limit, right? Every one of these attributes is going to have um, is going to have I mean every one of these subclasses will have a start, stop, park. But there might be some attributes that are different and some methods that are different as we see. So, relationships amongst objects and classes so those of you that understand active directory a little bit understand that active directory in active directory we create these things called objects some of them are already built for us we have a user object okay so everyone that's going to log onto the network has to have a user object and that user object then may inherit sub objects or sub classes of user okay power user administrator you know, lockdown user are going to have different attributes, different methods. <laughs> so here we have a parent object. The attributes of this employee object are social security number, telephone number, hire date, title, pay rate. We move over to the child object. Child object is instructor. It inherits, it inherits, inherits? Where did that come from? It inherits common attributes and then adds additional attributes that more uniquely define it. Okay. So could we take this into an object called order? Yes. Right? So we have this order object. Are there going to be some common things on an order? Yes. Are there going to be some unique things? Yeah, we may have a, a child object called rush order or ground order right as a sort of cheesy example but you get it <laughs> so one of the things we do with classes is we create this object relationship diagram or class relationship diagram so this way what we can do is start diagramming the commonality okay and some of the methods that would exist between objects so we have this object called an employee <laughs> A manager is an employee, an office staff is an employee, an instructor is an employee. So you can see we can create this parent object called employee with all the things that are common that we would find in manager, office staff, instructor. Okay? Then we start looking at these objects and say, what do the objects do? You know, a manager determines a fitness class schedule. The foot fitness class schedule, you know, lists open fitness classes. The fitness class schedule, people register using the registration record, you know, and the process continues. This is not a very common diagram that's done. The reason being, can you see some similarity between this and a data flow diagram? Because if we're going to do anything with data, we've got to have an object to instantiate the data. Right? So UML, universal, uh, uni unified modeling language, it's just a set of symbols to represent graphically the various components and relationships within a system. Mainly is used to support object-oriented systems analysis and to develop the object models. So if we do this correctly and we have enough detail, the programmer is going to be able to take an object and quickly program it. What happens if we miss a method, though? <coughs> We're going to be in trouble. Agreed? So our documentation better be detailed. If you start thinking about all the documentation we're creating, some of the documentation parallels the other documentation, so we know in leveling if we have some object here, we're going to need to have it over here. Okay, so one of the graphical ways to do this is with use case modeling. Okay, now one of the things that I wish that they would do um, is right here we should have a box, and that's the boundary of our system. Okay, so here we may have three different systems. 
this might be the boundary of, a, of an air um, reservation system, flight reservation system. The actor, this is the actor. This is the little symbol we use for actor. The actor, just like if you remember in our context diagram, falls outside of the system, right? So we created this zero object, and that was the system. And all the external entities, an external entity is an actor, someone who will interact with the system. So when you go, all go about to create your, your um, use case, you're going to give me some examples of use case, then you're going to diagram one use case in your homework. You're going to want to create a boundary, okay? So the system for use case is an oval. Now, can a use case have many symbols? Are there many things we would do inside a use case? What do you think? Pretty simple question. It's either a yes or a no. Somebody have the guts to answer the question. Yes. You would say no. All right, we'll see if you're right. Okay. You know, also interact with other use cases. There's your answer right there. So let's take a look. So when the outcome of one use case is incorporated by another use case, we say that the second use case uses the first. So we have this use case called make reservation. As we break that down, there's going to be subcomponents of that. We don't want to program this big thing called make reservation. We want to program smaller objects that make up this thing called make reservation, right? So as we saw when we did our hotel reservation system, we started to see sub processes that would need to be created. So you identify use cases, try to group all the related transactions into a single use case. So in this case, what we would do is we would explode the make re airline reservation. That would be the title of our use case. And then we're going to have sub cases that compile the whole thing. And there's an example coming up. Here is an example of a great use case. Okay. So this is a complete use case diagram. Notice we have the boundary. What's inside the boundary? Our what? <clears throat> Our use case. So auto service department. That's the whole case. Okay. The sub cases are create work order, update schedule, prepare invoice. Now this is pretty simplified because we can see how create work order <coughs> excuse me, update work schedule, prepare invoice, what haven't we done? If we're working on a car, what do we probably need? What might we have to explode the update work schedule to be? Folks, if I'm a mechanic, what do I need to work on a car? Come on. What? Tools. All right, well, if I only have one set of specific brake tools, I have to schedule those into the work order. What else? Parts, thank you very much. And finally, if I have tools and I have parts, what do I need to schedule? The work, labor, someone to do it. Is every mechanic that works for me certified to do brakes on a Ford F-150? Probably not. So I need to make sure the certified mechanic is there, right? So we can see how we could explode this one even further. There's the boundary of our system. The actors interact with our system. Customer would request service. The service writer would write up based on the input given from the customer, what needed to be done, create the work order. From there, we might go out into, you know, schedule all those things. Then the work gets done, the mechanic updates the work order, finally it's ready to go, the service writer calls the customer, come pick up your vehicle, it is done, please bring us $900 for work that would have cost $400 if you did it yourself and followed the YouTube video, right? Somebody asked me the other day, well, how'd you fix your dryer? I'm like, Psh, YouTube, you know, went out to YouTube. They had my dryer, 
take this off, do this, pull this, get this part. Here's the part number. Order it from Amazon. It seems to be cheaper. Put it back in and it'll work. And amazingly, it does. I love YouTube. YouTube rocks. So class diagrams evolves into a physical model and finally becomes the functional information system. The programming. Class appears as a rectangle with the class name at the top, followed by the class attributes and methods, and then we'll talk about cardinality. But first, someone please give me an introductory definition to cardinality. What is cardinality? Number of elements. Let's find a little bit better. Ah, I see Garth going to the book. Maybe we can get some English going. Uh, cardinality describes how instances of one class relate to instances of another class. A little bit better, right? You were saying the same thing, just some fancy engineer put that definition out there. <laughs> so here's an example. Here is a class diagram. <laughs> now let me be very, very very clear on the homework for this chapter. When you create the class diagram, my expectation is that you will not just say, here's a class, it will have attributes, it will have methods. My expectation and the, and the question or the directions are written clearly. I expect to see some attributes and some methods. Is that clear? Okay, so maybe three of each. Let's get a little crazy. Give me four, I might fall off my seat. Okay. Oh my God, four attributes for sales manager. Like, let's see if I can come up with four right off the top of my head. Uh, first name, last name, location, hire date. All right, that took a long time. Oh, did I say you can't use those? No, I didn't. Somebody, Cody's writing them down. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Moving on, Eric, can you give us some for sales rep? Yes, I can. No. So the cardinality is, is right here, okay? Now, there's a couple ways to represent this. We can do this with numbers. We can also do it with the number of arrows that we create, okay? So depending on the program you're using, these may be arrows, okay? So let's take a look at this. A sales manager, one sales manager can manage many, this is many sales reps. However, one of the rules that we've decided on is one sales manager manages one sales office. Okay. Now, if we added this manager up here called district manager, well, then the district manager would manage, one district manager would manage many managers and also many offices, right? Okay. So as we go through this, a sales rep, one sales rep is assigned to many customers. You know, there are very few jobs where one sales rep has only one customer, but they do exist. Especially in large manufacturing, you know. <clears throat> I mean, if there's enough business and enough support that needs to be done. So one customer can place many orders, many orders, you know, Item ordered, one item can, can be um, ordered on many orders. Let's not confuse that, by the way, with the number of items ordered. We're talking about just the item itself. So I don't tend to be a real fan of this idea of sequence diagrams. I, I don't have you do them. Um, you know, include symbols to represent classes, lifelines, messages, focus. So, you know, this class, and, and I don't think they do a very good job of explaining it, but essentially we have two classes. And the lifeline, okay, is its what? What was that term we had up above? It's... Nope, it's state, right? So it's lifeline represents its state, where is it at, okay? And here what they're showing is that these two classes somehow interact together sending messages 
back and forth. So remember, we can have an instructor class and a grade book. And the message going to is instructor issues grade. Okay. <clears throat> now, a state transition diagram, that's where we can figure out what kind of states an object can be in. Okay. So we have this thing called something that opens an account. We would have an actor here. Opens an account. The state of that object is they are, say, a new customer. Okay. It is not until they make their first deposit that they become active or existing. Can we have someone who comes in? This doesn't happen anymore, but could we have someone who comes in? I'll give you a great example. Jewelry store. You want to buy that ring or buy that nice watch. Well, first of all, you want to know how much you can afford, right? So you fill out the credit app. Well, the idea is that you're filling out that credit app so you're going to purchase something. You are a customer, but you have yet to be an active or existing customer until you place the order, until you purchase something. But you're in my system, so you're new. You make a deposit. Well, let's see what happens, okay? What's some things that can happen? So customer closes the account. Well, if, they, if the customer closes the account, it goes into a state of closed, okay, or former, and the bank would also close the account. Okay, so existing active, um, for some reason, assets were attached. We freeze the account. If the account becomes unfrozen, they become active again. So what's an example of freezing an account? I, over, I overdraft, right? Or in the case of our jewelry store, I'm inactive, but I haven't made my payment. Therefore, my account gets frozen. I can't come in and buy anything else, right? That would not be a good thing. Oh, yes, you haven't paid your bill in six months, but come on in and buy something else. So state transition diagram, small circle to the left is the initial state, okay? Or the point where the object first interacts with the system. We read from left to right, that makes sense. The circle at the right with the hollow border is the final state. Now, does that mean that the final state can't become the new state again? Could be. <laughs> Let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> if you haven't placed an order with my company in a year, am I going to keep you as an active customer? No, I might put you into an inactive state. But then three months after I put you in, a, in an active state, you come back as a customer. Do I want you to have to put all that information in again? No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take maybe your email address. That seems to be what's used a lot, right, to create an account. I'm going to take that email address and say, hey, you used to be a customer, but you're not, but you have come back. Thank you very much. And what might I present to you if you haven't been a customer in a while before you place an order? What might I want to confirm? My information. Yeah, your information. Sorry. So I might present you a screen saying, hey, before we go to place that order, let's just make sure that the information that I have is correct. Does that make sense? But I don't want you to have to re-enter it again, and I certainly don't want you to create a new customer account. Because now, how do I link those two to really get what your buying history is? And do I want to go back and query my existing customers to see what they're buying, how they're buying, and profile them? Yes. Why? Advertise to them. Advertise to them. Yep. If I'm a video game manufacturer and I have a video game that profiles, you know, in the 20 to 30 female category, and 90% of the people that play that are that demographic, am I going to market that? to the 19 year old male demographic, the you know teen, teen demographic? Probably not, right? Probably not. <laughs> so with UML, an activity diagram, similar to a state diagram would look like this. So th the start state is that customer needs cash. 
So we go to an ATM. We insert the ATM card. Well, a couple things that could happen. Okay, the card is accepted. Now, this is even before the customer puts in the pin. How do I know via my card where it's going to be accepted? Well, it's going to be accepted on the Plus Network, the Intra Inc., and Money Pass Networks. So if I see one of those logos, right, I also know that if it's U.S. Bank, I probably am going to be able to go to what? A U.S. Bank. What happens if I go outside that network? You all know what happens if you go outside the network? It charges some money. Yeah. There is nothing worse. I really, really have to be desperate to walk into Butler Market Store and, and be charged $2 to get out 20 bucks. You know, that just, okay, I don't need that energy drink that bad. All right. What's that? There you go. Yep. And my bank, because of my account, will let me do that a couple times a month, I think, two, two times a month. So. so the card's accepted by the ATM, which means the ATM can process the card. The customer enters the PIN. If the PIN is accepted, then the customer can request cash. If the PIN's not, now, this isn't a full activity diagram, is it? Because what happens if the PIN's bad? Where would we go back to? What would we tell the customer to do if they enter the wrong pin? Enter it again. And then we need to determine how many times we're going to allow them to try a pin on a stolen credit card or a debit card, right? <laughs> Before we do what? What happens if you have a brain fart and you forget your pin three times? It sucks the card in. Yep. So what that means is I can go try a couple pins pull out the card, go to another ATM, try a couple pins, you know. So then if the customer requests cash, then we go through the process of saying, is there enough cash? Is there not enough cash? If we present this to a lay person, is this going to be easy to follow though? It is. <laughs> yeah. So activity diagrams, sequence diagram, trades and uh, state transition diagrams. All of the modeling tools, do we need to use all of them? No. You know, do we need to have an object that's instantiated in a state diagram and a sequence diagram? Not necessarily. <coughs> We've talked about case tools as a means of creating these diagrams. If we standardize our diagrams, if we're all on the same project team, we're all creating cases that look similar, we're all labeling our actors the same, our use cases, you know, with the same sort of structure, we're all going to be able to understand each other's parts, right? So creating them by hand can be time consuming. We have case tools to speed up the process. We also have this really cool case tool called Visio. We can just pop these into Visio and go. And a lot of times, if we're using project management software, we have the ability to create a case, to give it the actors, to instantiate the relationship between the actors and the specific use cases inside the ultimate case, and it pops up a diagram for us. Develop an object relationship diagram that provides an overview of the system. Well, in a way, we sort of do this with the sort of do this with the data flow diagram, don't we? So organize your use cases and use case diagrams so that they can be linked to appropriate class, state transition, et cetera. So what we would do is we would create this use case, okay, and whatever numbering system we give it, we would get the state transition diagram, the same numbering system, <coughs> so that we could go through and find it. Much easier to repair a diagram now than to change the software later. We want to have all of this stuff done, know it's correct, know we have each object, know we have every attribute, know we have every method before we start to program. Because when we start writing code, folks, when we start writing code, does the code we write for one object affect what happens in other objects? Okay. So... 
If we put garbage in, are we going to cascade that garbage throughout the system? Good. Y'all get that. Great. So I'm going to uh, shut off the lecture. And what we're going to do in class today is we're going to do a quick, probably get you out of here early. Um, we're going to do a quick discovery of what this might look like. We're going to extend our reservation system. Okay, and build a use case for our reservation system. Okay, which means we'll take five minutes. Y'all need to figure out how to get some energy and be ready to go. Cool. For those of you watching at home, thank you very much. We will see you later. <laughs>